Um, but as I was saying, friends, my, uh, my name is Lucas Mann, and I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, and I care for your souls. I care for where you're going to go when you die, and so I come out here, take time out of my day to, to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul himself said in Romans 1, that he was not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And uh, even though we find ourselves today in the Bible Belt, uh, in the biblical South, uh, there is so much of an ignorance as to what is the biblical gospel. What is the true gospel of Jesus Christ? Even though there seems like churches on every corner, people are very ignorant as to what is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if the Bible says it is the, it is the means of salvation, it's, uh, it's that which we must believe to be saved, then we better know our stuff concerning this. We, we better know truly know and believe the true gospel of Christ. And so that is the gospel I seek to make known to you this afternoon. To tell you that Christ is the Savior. He is the Lord. And He saves those who, who cry out to Him for eternal life. Uh, Romans 10.11 tells us that he who believes in Him shall not be disappointed. That is, if their trust is in Christ alone for eternal life, they cannot be disappointed because Christ is a perfect Savior, a perfect Redeemer. And the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon is in Romans chapter 2, in verse 3. Romans chapter 2, verse 3, and the Apostle Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He writes these words. He says, But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And what Paul is speaking on here in verse 3 of chapter 2 of Romans is the pride of the religious. The pride of those who consider themselves to be people who worshiped God. And this is a timely message for our culture here in the South. This is a timely message for Lawrence County. Because as I just said, we are, we are filled with a knowledge about the Bible to some extent in God and the Lord Jesus Christ. People know these things. Most people here grow up in church so yes, in one sense do they know these things, and in one sense they claim to be religious, but it is not a saving knowledge. And the religion that they claim to have is not the true religion of Jesus Christ. It's not true salvation. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 7 that there are many on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord. And He will say to them, Depart from Me. You who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. There will be many people on the day of judgment that will think themselves to be converted, think themselves to be Christians, and Christ will turn them away. Christ will turn them away. And dear friends, I don't want you to be one of those people. I don't want you to be religious yet lost, yet have an outward appearance of religion, but inwardly have no reality of it. Instead, I want you to be truly the child of God, the son or the daughter of God. And Paul was dealing with that issue here in Romans 2. The Jewish people in Paul's day thought they knew the true God. They thought they were, were really the children of God. They thought that they, they, they had it. But yet what happened? They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in Jesus' ministry... He had some harsh words to say. Jesus was very harsh at certain times in His ministry. And the, who were those harsh words for? When Jesus spoke very strongly, who, who were those words directed towards? It was always the religious. It was always the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. It was always the people who said that they had the truth. And yet they truly did not have the truth. And so this is a very, very timely message indeed. And the only way one can know whether they have a, a genuine right standing with God is if it is through Christ. If, if it, is in, is if, it, it is if their faith is in the true gospel message. 
There's only one way to God, friends. Only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. It's through believing the Gospel of grace. And so it is that Gospel I seek to proclaim to you this day. But before I do, I want to consider the context of this verse and what Paul is is doing here in Romans chapter 2. And to really understand where Paul is coming from, we actually have to go back to chapter 1 of Romans. And as I just said a few minutes ago, Paul said in verse 16, he said, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So that, was, that is what theologians call the Paul's thesis statement for the book of Romans. It's what he's going to spend the rest of the book unpacking for us, is the Gospel of grace. But for someone to understand the good news of what Christ has done, they must come to grips and they must understand the holiness of God and the righteous wrath of God that's revealed against those who are wicked. They must understand that they're sinners in the hands of an angry God and that they deserve His wrath. They deserve hell. In fact, Jesus Christ preached more on hell than He did about heaven in His ministry. That's very telling. It's because Jesus cared for sinners and wanted to warn them about the impending judgment. And so that is exactly what Paul first does. He first brings the bad news. That's why in verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And he goes on in those next few verses and unpacks this idea and is very thorough in his covering of the bad news. And really, most of what he talks about in Romans 1, though, is directed against those who are not religious, the pagans, the idolaters. But then in chapter 2, he directs his attention toward the religious. And he says, basically, in effect, in chapter 2 of Romans, even if you're religious, you need salvation. Even if you think you're good enough to make it to heaven, you're not. No one is good enough to make it to heaven. I certainly am not. We've all sinned. We've all fall, we all fall short every day of God's glory, God's perfect standards. And so religious or non-religious, we all need salvation. We all need the new birth. We all need eternal life in Christ. We need God to condescend and to do a work in our hearts to raise us to spiritual life. And so that's why in chapter 2, in verse 1, he begins by saying, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. So what in effect he's saying is, you, you religious people judge others for doing wicked things, but you do the same things. And in fact, by your judging their wicked deeds, you are condemning yourself because you're, you're acknowledging you know those things are wrong. You know those things are wicked. And then in verse 2, he actually says, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. We all know that. We all know that if someone breaks God's law, they deserve His judgment. No one ever disagrees with a, a murderer here on earth or a, a rapist here on earth being punished for breaking the law. It's because we all have a sense of justice. We know right from wrong. And we know that those who do wrong ought to be punished. And so when it comes to God and His perfect holiness, when people break His law, it's only just that He punishes the evildoer. But nonetheless, as we just read in, in verse 3, He directs His attention toward those religious people who supposed and thought that they could escape God's judgment by their own righteousness or by even their judging of others, but they could not. And that is what I want to see here in this text is the pride of the religious. In verse 3, he says, But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. Now, it is important that we understand that God is not here saying that you're not allowed to exercise judgment and to discern other people's actions. Jesus Himself said in John 7, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. It is the will of God that people exercise proper judgment. 
But when they do so with hypocrisy, in fact, what they do by doing that is they bring upon themselves condemnation. And so these religious people here spoken of in verse 3 were doing that. They were judging others, but they were doing it in hypocrisy. And they were practicing the things that they were judging others for doing. And Paul challenges their supposition, thinking that they, by doing that, escaped God's judgment. By putting themselves up as, as the judge and arbiter for someone else's salvation, they thought that by that they would be saved. But in fact, Paul calls out the fact that they practiced those very things. And we know that. We know from the history of the Old Testament and even in Jesus' day that the Israelites, the Jewish people, practiced hypocrisy. They said they had the true God, but they did not obey Him. And that's evidenced by when God Himself came down, the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty in human flesh, and they rejected Him. And that is even what we see today in the Bible Belt, in the biblical South. Many people have churchianity, but they don't have Christianity. Many people have an appearance of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They say that they know the Lord Jesus Christ. They have walked the aisle. They have said the prayer. They have, quote, asked Jesus into their heart. And yet, they are lost. They are like the Jewish people who said that they had the true God, but in fact, they did not. That's a fearful place to be in. That's a very fearful place. That's a scary, that's a bad place to be in. And I know and, and believe the Word of God concerning this, and so I believe that in your midst, in my midst right now, there are some of you, perhaps many of you, who are in this position of saying that you have Christ, yet you do not possess Him. Saying that you know Him, yet you truly do not. And friends, it is my hope that God had used the preaching of the Gospel, the true Gospel, to convict your souls, to convict you, and to bring you to saving faith in His Son. You know, for many years of my life, I lived as a false convert. Eight years as a false convert, I said I was a Christian. But I lived as though Christ never gave me a law to obey. I cared not of the things of God. I cared not of holiness. But I'm so grateful that God came into my life truly and actually saved me. That He raised me to spiritual life. Something I could not do in and of myself or by myself. And perhaps that is what some of you need here today to happen to you. Perhaps you need to be raised to spiritual life. I do not know. But I simply will preach and be faithful to do what I'm called to do, trusting that God will, as He so desires, draw those whom He wills to Himself. Jesus Himself said in John 6, No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so it is God working. It is God working all things to the end that He might be glorified. But we ask ourselves... From this verse, why were these people this way? Why are even now today in, in Lawrence County, why are there so many people who are deceived, who think they have it, but they don't? What's the issue? Well, firstly, it is a wrong view of God. People have a wrong view of God. And I've been doing this for quite some time, street preaching and um, doing ministry at various places, and I run into this all the time because we're in the South. Time and time again do I run into people who say they know Christ, but they don't. And they're deceivers, they're liars. And one of the things I always see with these people is that they do not have a, a proper understanding of who God is. They don't know God. Really, they don't. They have, a, they have a, a warped view of God. In fact, you could say the God of the Southerners here in South Carolina is not the God of the Bible. He's more like a grandfather in the sky with a big long beard who just pours out blessing on everybody, arbitrarily. And that's not the God of Scripture. It's not. So who, who is God? Who, according to Scripture, who is God? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Leviticus, it uses this term, holy 87 times. 87 times. And it's all throughout the Old and New Testament. God is holy. 
That is that God in His, in His essence and who He is is set apart. The word holy means sanctified. It means set apart. It means He is set apart from all that is evil and all that is perverse. He's perfect in His character. And that is probably one of the things that many false converts do not get concerning God's character. That He's holy. It's a lost concept. Another attribute of God is that He is just. That He must punish the wicked. And this is all throughout the Bible. The justice of God. Just as a judge here on earth must punish those who break the law, so too must God punish the wicked. In fact, in Nahum chapter 1, in the Old Testament, it says these words in Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And then in verse 2, just one verse back, Nahum wrote, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. That's an, that's an aspect of God's character that people forget, and people don't want to accept. What's another attribute of God? God is love. That's, that's so true. Uh, 1 John 4 eight tells us that God is, is love personified. He is the definition of what love is. It is true also that God is gracious. God shows kindness and favor to those who do not deserve it. Well, we all experience that on a day-to-day -day basis. Even right now, the weather outside right now is just gorgeous. Beautiful, beautiful afternoon. That's a gift from God. That's out of God's grace. Also, God is merciful. And mercy, that, that speaks to the fact that God holds back from sinners what they deserve. In other words, what do we deserve? We deserve to be thrown into hell, friends. We deserve God's judgment. And yet... Oh, God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good afternoon. And God every day holds back His wrath from the wicked. In fact, the Bible tells us time and time again, God is patient. God is patient. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's giving you time to repent and to flee unto His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the Old Testament, before the flood came, God gave a very long a period of time for the people in Noah's day to repent. But then one day, finally, the flood came. But that whole time the ark was sitting there being constructed and the people could have walked in and found refuge before the flood came. And so too it is with Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He is the ark of salvation and He is waiting. He is there. And all who come, all who will come, come to Christ and live so that in the day of judgment, in the day of God's wrath, when it comes, you may have refuge. In fact, Nahum chapter 1, just as we read, down in verse 7, it reads these words. It says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. That's incredible. It really is. But my friends, I want you to know something about God's attributes. They do not cancel one another out. God's love does not trump God's hatred. God's grace does not trump God's wrath. God's mercy does not negate or, or throw away His holiness. In fact, these, they stand in beautiful harmony with one another. Beautiful unity. That's how in this same, as we just read out of Nahum 1, that's how the text can say in verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. There are His attributes side by side. Incredible. See, God is not like we conceive Him to be. He is the sovereign King, the sovereign Lord who reigns over the universe. And He brings all things to pass as He so pleases to the end that He might be glorified. That's the God of Scripture. That's the God of glory. And not only has God just declared Himself to be holy, but He has shown His holiness and He has shown His perfection in His law. 
in His Ten Commandments. See, many of you, perhaps who grew up religious, are familiar with the Ten Commandments. Perhaps you have a great familiar, a fam familiarity with the Ten Commandments themselves. Well, those commands are there for really two purposes. God's law is there for two purposes. One, God's law is there to show us who He is. God's law is there to show us who He is, the perfection of His character. God bless you guys. Why is that? How do we know that? Well, look at the commands with me. I'll just read a few of them out of Exodus chapter 20. In verse 7, I'll begin. God says to the Israelites, He says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who keeps his name, or excuse me, takes his name in vain. Verse 12, God says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Verse 13, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, why did God give these laws? Why did God put forth these statutes? It was to show us who He is. It's to show us the perfection of God's character, His purity and His holiness. It's to show us who He is. As the commands say, one of them says, You shall not murder. Why does God say that? Because He's not a murderous God. You shall not commit adultery. Why does God command that we ought not commit adultery? It is because God is a perfect covenant-keeping God. He keeps all of His promises and He will never fail to keep them. You shall not steal. That's because God Himself in His perfection is not a thief. He does not take that which... Uh, it is, he is not a, he's not a thief in, in any way. Another command. Verse 16. God says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That is, that you should not lie. And the reason God says it is because He's not a liar. Oh, man. Hey, hey, how are you doing? I'm sure hey. I'm, I'm Lucas Mann. Nice to meet you. What are we doing today? I'm just uh, preaching to people at the gas station. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is it is this public sidewalk? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Just want to be sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The reason I'm out, we, we just got to complain. No worries. I figured, I figured this is what it's for. Here you go. Yes, sir. All right. You still living at 100 Cleveland yep. Street in Yep, yep, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I pastor a, I pastor a church up in uh, up in Lawrence. Okay, so, the yeah. Uh, it's called the Spring Church. It's out on 221 near the hot spot. It's kind of back in the woods. You can't really see it that well, okay. but the sign's out in the road. So, South Carolina 103-574-016 103 Am I doing? Am I doing anything illegal? No. Okay. Okay. Like I said, I just got called out because because of a complaint. Yeah, there was I a man here. He seemed a little agitated, and I think that might have been who it was. Okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, I I, I, um, I I saw this place and uh, I saw the sidewalk and I thought, well, this is public sidewalk, and um, as long as I'm not necessarily yeah. intruding on their property. Just status quo. But even that, it's a business, so I don't, unless they ask me to come off, then I right. certainly would. <laughs> Temple. Are you parked anywhere over here? I am. I'm parked right there. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's your license. Back. Okay. I'm going to go talk to the clerk real quick and make okay. sure it's okay for you to stay here. Okay. okay. Yeah, if not, I can uh, I can just park somewhere else and walk down here. That's that's no problem. Thank you, officer. You called a party. Huh? You called a party here. I didn't do that. <laughs> it wasn't me. Did I speak to you, Billy? 
there, young man. Sure, absolutely. What's your name, sir? My name's Calvin. Nice to meet you. I'm Lucas Mann. I'm the Glad pastor of the Spring I, Church. That's what I heard. That's the plan of salvation. Okay. Oh, well, when you were okay. asking me, the re, uh, the reason I was saying that is that's the term's not no used problem. in the Bible. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't but know what you're this, talking about. This is the plan of salvation. You don't do this, you're without God and without Jesus in your life. Yeah, you believe the gospel of grace. Uh, Acts, Acts, well, uh, uh, and see, you confess, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ. If you're never baptized into Christ, all that's where all the spiritual gifts are. If you're never baptized into Christ, yeah, I would disagree with you because salvation is well, by grace, not by uh, works. Uh, it's oh, a yes, it is. Read James. Oh, you, you misunderstood what James wrote. I'd love to discuss no, it. I got to speak to the officer right now. You got my number. But, oh, okay, good. I'll give you a call. You good to stay here? Okay, God bless you. Said you good. So if you want to go get some water or something, you can go up and pay for it. Someone actually bought me water. It was very nice okay. of them. Um, as long as you're on the sidewalk, I'm good with it. You ain't yeah, I did. I think she may, it seems like from what I, from my perspective, she may have been concerned because that man was just ag very agitated. Right. And she may have been concerned for the safety of the people here. So I understand. Okay. But uh, thank you guys for your presence. Really do thank you very much. Yeah. All right, you guys as well. Well, we need to respect our law enforcement, that's for sure. And uh, I say God, God bless them for protecting us. I greatly esteem them for putting their lives on the line every day so thank you guys very much y'all have a, a very safe day um as i was saying uh before uh, before that happened it was the first time this ever happened to me so uh, first time for everything but uh, in, in exodus 20 as, as i was just looking at it concerning who god is the character of god and in, in, in relation to his law what what does god's law show us as i was saying it shows us who he is in fact just as uh, as i was saying a moment ago Concerning lying, God says in Exodus 20 verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the reason God says that is because God is, is not a liar. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us it is impossible for God to lie. It is an, it's an impossibility for God to, to bear a false witness concerning something. He is perfect in His character and so His law therefore is a reflection of His perfection. Of the, the impeccability of His character. And secondly, my friends, the law shows us something else. And that is our character in light of God's character. And this is something that the, uh, the, the false convert, the religious yet lost person, has a hard time understanding. And it is their sinfulness before God. And it's because they cannot understand it. It's spiritually ascertained. These things are spiritually accepted. And the natural man cannot understand the things of God. But the law of God, as I said, shows us the character of man. How is that? Well, consider the commands. You shall not murder. You may say, well, listen, I have never murdered someone. I'm not in prison today. I've never been convicted of such a crime. But here's the thing. Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and said that if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, it is equated with murder. God sees it the same way. You deserve hell just as a, a murderer deserves hell. My friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. And he sees that the mind and the heart is perverse and evil. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked, desperately sick. It's perverse. Romans 3 tells us there is not one who does good. There's not even one. Another command God gave. You shall not commit adultery. And again, people will say, listen, I've never committed that crime. Well, again, our Lord Jesus came and in Matthew 5 said that if you look at a woman with lust for her, you commit adultery already with her in your heart. And that goes for you women too. If you look at a man with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. It's a perverse thing. Another one, God says you shall not steal. Have you ever stolen in your life? Well, then God sees you as a thief. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelations, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Dear friends, if we've lied, then we deserve God's punishment for sin. That's just four. Just four of the Ten Commandments. Murdering, adultery, stealing and lying. And yet we've broken all four of them. What if we went through all ten of the commandments? What would we find? We would find that we ourselves break God's law. 
just as a murderer here in South Carolina, having broken the law, must be judged. He must, be, he must stand before a tribunal here in South Carolina and be found guilty and be punished for his law-breaking. So too it is with God, dear friends. And I say that because I care for your souls. I really genuinely care for you. So too it is with God. When we break His law, when we trample His law underfoot, what is that? That's, that's, that's law-breaking. And therefore that deserves judgment. That deserves punishment. And so if we have broken God's law, and if we have trampled His law underfoot, what is our, uh, our due punishment? What do we deserve for breaking God's law? What is it? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, He said of concerning lawbreakers, He said, These will go away into eternal punishment. And then in verse 41, just a few verses back, He said this concerning lawbreakers. He said, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. There is a place that is described in the Bible as hell, as Hades, as the lake of fire as the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place of outer darkness, the place of the unquenchable fire, the eternal flame, and that is a place I do not want you to end up, friends. 150,000 people die every single day. You could be one of them, dear friends. Today could be your day. And I don't want you to stand before God and be thrown into hell. But that is what we all deserve. That's what I deserve. That's what you deserve. Is God's judgment. God is just in sending people to hell. It is in accordance with His character. It's in accordance with who He is. In fact, if He did not send people to hell, He wouldn't be holy, He wouldn't be just, and He would be a God who really cannot be trusted because we don't know whether He's always going to do what's right. And so, dear friend, that's a scary thing to have a God like that. But the God of glory is just and is holy. And so we find ourselves outside of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, condemned to hell without hope. And no amount of religious deeds or, or righteousness that we can procure for ourselves will save us. No amount of prayers or going to church or being a deacon or a pastor in a Southern Baptist church will save you. No amount of offerings that you give to a religious organization will save you. Doesn't matter how many times you've been baptized or how many times you've asked Jesus into your heart, none of those things will save you. None of those things will justify you. In fact, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, it says these words. Verse 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, but not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. That describes us, friends. That describes sinful humanity. In fact, that last line, their feet are swift to shed blood, that's true of America. You know what happens in America every day? Over 3,000 babies are slaughtered in their mother's womb. That's horrible. We're a nation that's killing 3,000 babies a day through the horror of abortion, through the holocaust of abortion. Dear friends, these sins earn eternal damnation. And there's no hope. There is no hope in ourselves. But, but God being rich in mercy. See, here's the thing we have to realize about God. It is true that He is holy and righteous, but He is also abounding in loving kindness and abounding in grace toward His people. And so what God did in His love toward His elect is He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God Almighty, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ came down some 2,000 years ago. Galatians 4.4 4 says that when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son, born under the law, born of a virgin. And He came and fulfilled God's law. See, that very law that we have broken, those very commands that we have transgressed, 
Christ came and fulfilled. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So when the command says you shall not lie, guess what Jesus did? He never lied. When the command says you shall not dishonor your parents, He honored His parents perfectly. When it says you shall not commit adultery, He never committed adultery. He never, he never stole. He never broke God's law. He kept it in, in absolute perfect submission to the will of the Father. See, you are saved by religious works, just not your own. It's the work of Christ. It's the religious works of Jesus Christ. There's only two religions in the world, friends. There's human accomplishment and divine accomplishment. Pick which one you want. Trying to please God by your own performance or to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ, at the pinnacle of His ministry, He went and He laid Himself down as a sacrificial lamb. He died a sinner's death on the cross of Calvary. He was, and then before even he was crucified, he was beat and whipped and spat upon. His own disciples abandoned him out of fear. One of them betrayed him into the hands of pagans and sinful men. And he was nailed to a cross. And he was sacrificed as a lamb, as a lamb without spot or blemish, as the, the soothing aroma to God the Father. And something happened at that cross that is not spoken of very often in churches today. And it is this, that at that cross, the Father unleashed upon His Son the full fury of His wrath. The Father crushed Him whom He loved. In fact, Jesus cried out at the cross in Mark 15, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is, my God, my God, why have You forsaken Me? Isaiah 53.10 tells us this. In verse 10 it says, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. And this is the mystery. This is the glory of the Gospel. The Father was pleased to crush His Son? Yes! It pleased His justice. It satisfied His justice. What did I say at the beginning? God's love and God's mercy will never negate His justice. And so they're in beautiful harmony with one another. So when we speak of the Gospel and God's mercy shown to sinful mankind, it is never negating His justice, but it is beautiful harmony with it. And so Christ comes and takes upon Himself the wrath of God that we deserve to be poured out on us for all eternity in hell. That's what hell is, friends. Hell is not a place where the devil's poking people with a, fi a, a, a pitchfork. It is where God Himself is punishing the wicked. Hell is a place that's... It was designed for Satan and his angels. And so Jesus, the Son of God, the one who did not deserve, the one who never deserved to be crushed and never deserved to be, to be slain under God's wrath, that very thing happened to Him. And He was crushed under the weight of the Father's justice. And so He cried out at that cross, to Telestai, one word in Aramaic, which means it is finished, it is paid in full. The bail, the fine is put away. See, dear friends, if you break the law, if you get a speeding ticket, and you, you decide to try and to contend that within court, and you stand before the tribunal, and the judge says, no, I reject your contention. You, you're guilty. You deserve the punishment. God bless you, sir. Thank you. You have a good afternoon. And the judge says, no, you're guilty. You've got to pay the fine. You've got to. Or if it's a large enough ticket, they might throw you in prison if you refuse to pay for the fine. But if someone steps in into the courtroom and they pay the fine for you, they pay it in your place, then the judge can dismiss your case and the fine has been paid for. The law has been satisfied. And that's what the cross of Jesus Christ is. Christ pays the fine for our sin. He pays the bail. The penalty is taken on Him. Listen to what Isaiah 53, this is written 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years before the Son of God came. And it says these words in verse 4. It says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed.
That's glorious. That's beautiful. That's the gospel message. Christ satisfies. He propitiates God's justice. That's the love of God. That's how kind God is toward His people. Jesus loved His church so much that He laid Himself down for her. In fact, in Ephesians 5.25, Paul commands the men in Ephesus. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Mm, that's so, so glorious. God bless you, sir. And so then, three days later, Christ is raised from the dead. The Father raises Him up as the public display that He had received a sacrifice, that Christ truly paid for our sin, and He is alive today, dear friends, never to die again. He is high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And the Bible says He lives to make intercession for those who will draw near to God through Him. That is the glorious gospel of grace. And so what the sinner must do, here is the call of the gospel, the sinner must repent and believe. They must flee their sin, flee their rebellion, flee their pornography. You think, friends, that God forgets when you hit the delete button on your internet browsing history? He sees it. He sees it, friends. God calls sinners to repent of all their sin, their lying and their, their selfishness, their pride, and to humble themselves and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe that He is Lord, that He is Savior, to take God at His Word, to take God at, at His promise as He reveals it in the Gospel. The Gospel is a promise of eternal life to those who will believe the promise. And if you do that, God will forgive you of all your sin. Every last one of your sins will be pardoned and you will be given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God will count you as if you lived Christ's life. That's the exchange of the Gospel. Jesus takes my sin. Jesus takes my filth and I get His righteousness. I get His perfection. And so when the Father looks at me, He sees Christ. And when He looked at, when he looked at Christ at the cross, what did He see? He saw me. He saw my sin. Christ in my place and I take Jesus' righteousness. There's no greater deal than that. There's no greater message than that. And so I call the sinner to believe this message of eternal life. And even for the Christian, this is the heart of our faith, brethren. This is the heart of our faith. And this is what we ought to feed on daily. For the Christian, this is his or her daily bread. Indeed. And even for the religious, as we have discussed here in Romans chapter 3, the religious, even if you're religious, you need a Savior. You need salvation because you have sinned against God and you have profaned His holy name and you have offended Him. You need a Savior. You need Christ the Lord. And so I call out to even you who go to church, perhaps or even deacons or pastors, I call you to repent and believe. To turn to Christ and live. To trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And to flee self-trust. To fl flee religion, self-trusting, self-confidence and pride and to trust in Christ alone. God is jealous for the glory, friends. All the glory in salvation. Romans 4, 5 tells us, but to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. One chapter back, Romans 3, 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So you who are religious, flee to Christ this day. And as I said a moment ago, do it to the glory of God. This is all to the end that God would be glorified. This is all so that God is glorified in sinful people and in saving a sinful people whom He has chosen to redeem His elect from the, the earth. Christ's bride, the church, it is to bring God the glory. In fact, as Paul says himself in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways! 
For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became His counselor, or who has first given to Him, that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Friends, again, please flee to Christ. Flee to Him. Repent. Turn from your sin. Be broken. Weep and wail and mourn. Oh, I'm good. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I'm not out here for money. Thank you so very much, though. Are you a believer? Of course. How long have you been a believer for? Quite a while. Quite a while. Mm. Well, uh, let me give you a gospel track. And a card. This is a card to our church. There you go, sir. God bless you. You have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness. And so again, as I said, please come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 11, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And brethren, my fellow Christians, maybe there's some out here. Maybe there's believers in the midst. Please, proclaim this Gospel, live on this Gospel, and, and feed on it daily. It's our daily bread. And do it all to the glory of God and to the honor and praise of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you who are religious, I ask you, I cry out to you, don't trust in yourself, but trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for eternal salvation so that you will be saved on the day of wrath. So what we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verse 3, is that even though the religious, those who think themselves to be saved, pass judgment on others, even though they think that they can flee, they can, they can escape God's wrath by doing that, they will not. They will not. And that is why Christ is of the utmost necessity for all of us. To know that we are in Him and to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of our own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. As I said at the beginning, my friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church here in Lawrence. And I just want to say thank you. Um, and I, I, I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. And it is my heart's desire, it's my great burden that you would believe upon Christ. And it is to Him, I say, would be brought the glory and the honor and the praise forever. In all things, everything redounds to the glory of God. And so, it is to the glory of God that I come out here today. For the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, may He be glorified forever. Amen. Amen.